Yeah, thanks a lot. Welcome to my talk, Bridging the Gap from Data Science to Production. After the inter uh, introduction, a few words about myself. So I'm a data scientist at Innovex. I have a mathematical background, so this is why I really like mathematical modeling. I mean, this is important for being a data scientist. I've done a few projects in recommendation system, which is a really nice and interesting topic. Of course, I'm always interested to bring things into production, meaning that I don't just look to make some proof of concept, some, some nice models one time, and then like kind of forget about it. So I really want to see the gained value that you only get if you um, put things into production. And of course, I'm a, a big fan of the, the Python um, data stack. Um, just a few words about the company uh, I work for, for Innovex, who is uh, giving me the possibility to speak at uh, cool conferences like the EuroPython. Um, Innovex is an IT project house with a focus on digital transformation, and we offer everything around this, meaning from operation to application development, big data and data science, of course, and we got many offices all over Germany. So to the actual topic, data science to production, I mean, um, who of you have already like worked on a, on a data science project and in the end you had some, some, some really cool proof of concept but it was never really put into production? Can maybe, okay, so <laughs> it seems like this really is a big topic and a lot of people are talking about this. And um, it's, it's also a source of frustration. I mean, data scientists get frustrated after a while if they see like one proof of concept after the other that not really moves to production. And also the business side gets frustrated. So they have maybe hired a, a huge team of data scientists that do cool things, but in the end they can never say, okay, our data scientists, they did this and now we have maybe increased our revenue by 10%. And this is exactly why one should care about moving things to production. And this topic is definitely not an easy one. It has many different facets. And throughout the talk, I'm gonna to touch many of them. Before, and actually, um, one of the important things is the actual use case. So this data product or this model um, you are building. So, we're gonna now look at this from a really high level perspective. So this data product you wanna build in a company and if you look at that, you can basically say, okay, it's, it's quite easy. You have some, some data somewhere, you have, your, you have your model, this is basically doing some transformations and in the end you have some results, be it predictions or like decisions or whatever. So this is the really high level perspective. But from this, components, from these three components, we can already kind of classify what our use case is. And this um, we have to later keep in mind if we want to things, put things into production. For instance, the data. Is it coming from some relational database or some, some non-SQL database? Is it coming from some distributed file system? Or do you have to deal with stream-based data? Does your model really the whole time need to consume data as a stream? So this is an important question, and depending on your use case, you have to clarify um, how you're gonna do this in production and what the recency and frequency uh, requirements are. So like, are you dealing with batch data? Does your model need to react near real time, real time, or in a stream-based fashion? Then the model itself. And with the model, when I'm talking about model, I'm not only talking about the machine learning algorithm. So a lot of people say like, yeah, my model, and they actually think, yeah, that's the artificial neural network or that's the random forest. But um, actually the model includes everything from the point where you get your raw data to the point where you um, give back some kind of results. So this includes also the pre-processing so how you do cleansing, importation, how you scale your data, maybe all kind of feature engineering you do, like construction of new derived features, like some exponential moving average and so on. So this is all part of the model because if you do this on your laptop to, in some proof of concept, you later have to also put this into production and you need to, do the, you need to think about this and um, that you don't kind of re-implement everything. So then the last part is the results. So what do you do with your results? I mean, in a proof of concept, your results basically are maybe some, some CSV file 
and you make some nice plots and show it to some, to some product manager. But in production, you need to care, so do I put this in another database and are the consumers of my predictions, of my um, decisions or whatever, are they reading from the database? So the database would be your, your interface or is it, again, some distributed file system? Are you writing back new topics um, in a stream or maybe in a real-time use case, like how, it's many, uh, how it is quite often the case for recommendation system that you have to provide some kind of REST API so that people ask real-time for recommendations given a, a, user, um, a user preferences. So looking back now at the, at the whole picture, we have our data, we have our model, and we have our results, and everything needs to be in the end in production, so we care about deploying this model. And I've already said a lot about that we need interfaces. So we are in control of the model, and you need to define how you um, access the, the, the data and how you, in the end, return the results. And there, uh, most of the times, many um, other um, like, like teams um, um, exist who are in control of this, so it's important to, to speak to them, to communicate and to define interfaces. So um, to actually uh, give some more characteristics of a use case, um, we said already it's the delivery, so you can, uh, depending on your data use case, you can say it's a, it's, you need to have a web service or a stream or a database. Then important is also the problem class that you early on decide, okay, I want to do a classification, regression, recommendation. I need or do not need explainability because this will later on decide what kind of libraries you can use. So it's important to, to think about this uh, early on. Then the vol volume and velocity. Um, this will later tell you how your model, what kind of scalability requirements your model uh, needs to have. Then the inference and prediction. Is it enough to do the inference like once a day in a batch way, or again, real time or stream. So all this will later on decide how you gonna uh, put things into production. Additionally, you have uh, technical side conditions. Maybe you are working in a company where um, there's a huge Java stack. I mean, many companies, they have a Java stack, and this could be that they, want, uh, that they say, okay, but in the end, we can only roll out in a scalable way some Java model, and this is a technical condition, and you should think about this early on, because if you do then everything in pure Python, then you will be bound to just providing a proof of concept because your code will not be able to be moved to production. Or other things are, are uh, like, um, is it going to be an on-premise solution or uh, maybe in the cloud? So one important thing is there's no one-size-fits-all solution for this. I mean, there are uh, provider offering like, like uh, some holy grail, like use our framework and everything will work. So um, for me, it's, uh, yeah, this is not true. So do you really have to um, evaluate your use case before and then decide on a use case by use case basis? So the takeaway and uh, the learnings from this high level um, perspective of your data use case, your data product, is that you need to state the requirements of your use case early on. Think about uh, how to move things in production before you actually start some kind of proof of concept. Identify and check your data sources. So that means don't just get a one-time data dump that someone gave you uh, on an USB stick. So rather think, okay, where is the data coming from and how could I later access this data? Uh, in, a, in a productive way. Then define interfaces with other departments, meaning um, like if there's a, a special team for the management of the, of the uh, databases and um, the guys uh, who are filling the, the databases so that you define how the data should be formatted and so on. This will be important for production because if someone later changes maybe the schema of a database, um, everything could fail, of course. And another, um, another um, good advice actually is to test the whole data flow early on with some kind of dummy model or some kind of heuristic, meaning that you 
try to um, make the whole process from data reading a simple transformation and writing it back into a, a database or writing the results back into a stream that you test this technically early on to directly see where things could go wrong. So this is the part about the, the, the more like organizational uh, uh, or more like the use case aspect. Another big important thing I see in the topic of data science reproduction is actually quality insurance. Um, for, especially for data scientists, um, it's quite often so that they, um, that, they, um, yeah, that they program in notebooks and so on and code is more like a one shot um, kind of deal. But actually, um, building a data product um, is an iterative process. And this is a really old uh, method. Actually, it uh, has been invented by, by IBM, and it's more than 20 uh, years old. It's the cross-industrial -indust standard uh, process for data mining. And already there, they said, OK, if you do data mining, then it's going to be an iterative process. So you're going to grab your data, um, you're going to prepare your data, you come up with modeling, you evaluate, you get more insights about the data, and this just goes on and on and on. And the same goes actually for, for any kind of data product. So if you have now in mind that it's going to be iterative, of course, quality is going to be an important aspect. So quality in different, um, in different regions, for instance, um, if you program something, even if you just start with a, with a kind of proof of concept, make your code clean. So um, what I see quite often is that people use a lot of um, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and just put everything into a huge, huge uh, notebook. And if they have a similar um, task, they just copy over things and so on. This is not really uh, good uh, clean coding. And here we can actually learn a lot from uh, clean coding principles that Java developers most of the times have, like software design patterns, the solid principle, and uh, especially the clean code developer. I mean, who knows the website clean code developer who's, uh, okay, not so many hands. Yeah, this is actually what I, uh, what I, what I thought. So um, clean code is really important um, in the end for if you want to think, move things into production because other people are going to read your code, you have to make adjustments uh, and so on. And so there are many good resources and even uh, or even or especially as a Python developer, you should care about this. Another um, practical thing one should care about and do is continuous integration so that you continuously, if, if, your, if your team works on something, that you continuously integrate your code into a master code, that you have um, unit tests that continuously test your code, that you think about versioning, about packaging, about putting your packages, your artifact, on an artifact store, that you optimize this and embrace some kind of development uh, process. This, um, and. Um, this is actually quite easy to be done. I mean, there's an open source tool, Jenkins. I mean, I guess most of you know Jenkins. Who knows Jenkins? Who's, who knows and who's actually using Jenkins? Okay, <laughs> that's good. So um, what I always do when I, when I start a project, directly um, um, implement a really simple continuous integration process um, because it will help you so much later on and um, you're going to need it then later for production uh, anyways. Another thing is monitoring. So um, if you, if you um, do any kind of data product, you're of course interested in improving some key performance indicator. Like, like recommendations could be, we got to improve our <laughs> click-through rate, our conversions, and so on. So if you do that, of course, you need the whole time to monitor things. So how was it before? Um, you implemented your cool new algorithm. How is this, was it before? Maybe you tuned something or you retrained. So it's important to really monitor your KPIs. It's also important to monitor the whole, the whole setup, like um, how many requests did you have if you um, provide your, your recommendations or your predictions as a, as a REST service to see if this comes to some kind of limit. 
Um, then also check the total number of predictions. Maybe something was wrong in the data ingestion and now you, you're predicting not enough and check the run times and so on. So monitoring gives you the site. So not having any kind of monitoring is like, like flying an airplane uh, blindfolded. And this is also something that that Google says. So there's, the, um, there's an open source book by Google, the Site Reliability Engineering Guide, and they have this nice uh, hierarchy where they say, for any kind of product, the most important and fundamental thing they ask at Google is actually, we have to have monitoring in place. And I've seen so many times that people start with some, some data science project and no one uh, actually cares until monitoring, uh, about monitoring. Especially important for data science and, and data products um, is um, also monitoring how good the quality of your model is. And I mean, this is, um, yeah, you, you have normally your metrics, and of course, you check your metrics, but you can also do this in a live test. So here um, is a so-called response distribution analysis, and um, it's a classification. Let's say you're classifying if a picture is a cat or a dog, and if you... Um, just uh, make a histogram over all the results. So if it's rather around zero, a cat, or around one, a dog, and if you'd make a histogram over all the responses, you would directly see, okay, A is a working model, and B is a rather confused model, so it's not really sure about what it's uh, outputting. And having a simple thing like this in place will tell you directly um, if the model you maybe just deployed is, uh, is, is nonsense and uh, you have to replace it or fall back to another model or, or not. I mean, it's definitely better to see this yourself before another department calls or maybe a customer telling you that, um, yeah, whatever you just deployed is not predicting anything meaningful. Um, another thing regarding monitoring is think about A-B tests. So if you go to production, you will, um, you will care about those iterative processes, you will start implementing new features, you will make improvements to your model. So it becomes really important to keep track of how much you improved with respect to the current baseline. And it's not always like this that you can do this in an offline test. Um, you also have to show this in online metrics. And in the end, the business unit or the, the, the product owner, the, the stakeholder will care about the, the, the KPI because this is what he or she going to report to their superiors. Um, a nice um, additional uh, advantage you have if you are using a B test is that you can, for instance, also um, use hyperparameter optimization with the help of multi-arm bandits. Um, the technical requirements you have for A-B tests is, of course, you have to have versioning in place. So ver I'm really um, eager on versioning. So um, version your models, version your things, provide proper Python packages, because those versions, you need a link to the test groups if you do some A-B tests. That you see this was version 1.0 and this was version 1.1 with a new cool uh, feature. Um, and also you need to be able in production to deploy then several models at the same time because you're going to have at least two um, groups. And um, you need to be able to track the results really until the point where it's facing the customer or whatever consumer you have. So in case of recommendations, for instance, this would be um, you need to track that this prediction or this recommendation from model A uh, was shown to this um, user in, in group A. And so all this tracking has to be in place. Um, as if you're um, using a TensorFlow, I can recommend, so in one project we use TensorFlow Serving, with this, which is a tool, an open source tool by, by Google, which does a lot for this organization and management of different models um, for you. So those um, were some, some quality assurance aspect. Another big topic in the field of data science to production is actually organizational problems or like cultural problems. And again, it's nothing really new. So if we look at the, at the problems that normally just normal developers and operations have, most of the time if it's like if you have a group, like a team of pure developers and a, pu a team of pure operations, 
uh, people, then the developers, they say, okay, our responsibility is to, to code, to test, to make releases. Of course, they use version control. They do, in the best case, also continuous integration and so on. And when they are happy with something, they make this release, they throw it over the wall of confusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the operations team like, yeah, thank you. And now we got to package this. Uh, we don't understand what's in there, but we have to package this. We deploy it. We do the whole life cycle. Of course, there's going to be some configuration management to do. Um, we have to care about the security and the monitoring. And if you keep this completely split up, then people already um, realized like years ago that this is not the way you can really um, fast and efficiently develop software. And with data science and data products, um, this thinking even hurts more. So um, it's especially dangerous for data products and teams. And you seriously going to have a problem with all your speed and time to markets if you just think as a data scientist, yeah, how do I get the things in production? I don't care. It's not my job. So this is definitely the wrong way of thinking. So the, 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 the better way of thinking is that you have a team that thinks let's build a great data product and not, okay, I made a great model. So this is um, just a different way of thinking. And for the, well, uh, for the world of uh, software engineering, actually, there's this big movement. Um, how many of you know DevOps, DevOps culture, have heard of it? Okay, so a few. So the, the, the idea is just to, to overcome this wall of confusion to make a continuous delivery, so that's continuous integration, but one step further that you could at any point in time, if you decide, also deploy and deliver your software, and that you have heter heterogeneous teams of developers and um, operations people working together. So now, on, um, on the side of, um, of, of data scientists, it's actually, um, yeah, we can apply the same thing. So from my experience, like having pure teams of data scientists, they don't get anything into production because they just lack the knowledge, the knowledge how to deploy and how to do all those things you need to do to get it in production. So, that me, um, so the, the learning is actually that you have to have heterogeneous teams of software engineers, of data scientists, of data engineers, of operations uh, 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 people. And if they all work together, they also sh start sharing their knowledge and um, they can work together and, and on, 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 a, on a single product and see it as their responsible, uh, responsibility to get that product into um, production. And as a rule of thumb, um, it's even that for a single data scientist, you need two to three data engineers which do the things, uh, which help to uh, do the things around. So it's really, um, you don't actually need, need that many data scientists. Um, and uh, right now it's even harder to find good data engineers, um, at least on the, on the German market, than to find uh, good data scientists. Optionally, uh, what is also a good thing is to have um, a product manager also embedded directly in the team. And if your data product is any way related to some, um, yeah, for instance, like, again, the recommendation topic, if you, if you, see, if you have a customer facing um, user interface, then it's also good to have directly the, the user interface or UX expert in your team because um, how you show things to your customer will also dramatically influence uh, the results. So it's good to have this close and not in another team where they maybe do completely different decisions without uh, telling you about it. A company that actually um, does a lot of this um, organization is uh, Spotify. So they are really advanced uh, when it comes to this. They have fully autonomous teams for um, for every feature. So they call it it's like vertical teams um, with an end-to-end -end responsibility. So really from, from the design and from where the data comes to how it is shown in the, in the Spotify application or in the Spotify website, they're completely responsible, uh, responsible for this. And this allows them to, to iterate really fast and to have especially less uh, politics. And uh, this is, um, I've um, added a link here, so you can later 
um, read about. It's, it's uh, really interesting to see, and there are also a lot of talks on the web, how, how Spotify uh, organizes uh, their teams around this. So um, this was um, the, the, the organizational or more like the cultural aspect of data science reproduction, but we also have a language um, aspects, or as I would call it, like a two language problem. So as I've said before in the industry, um, many people use Java and the reasons are this, uh, for this are, are quite, uh, yeah, quite obvious. So many people argue that having a strongly typed uh, language is so more um, safe because already the, the compiler finds a lot of uh, edge cases and so on. And um, it has a stronger emphasis on, on robustness and edge cases than it's, it has been an industrial standard um, for many ages and uh, for many years. And people know how to deploy things. So if you go in, in many companies, you will find that um, if there's a separate operation team, they will say, OK, um, only Java things will get into production in the end. So I don't care what you do as a data scientist, but it's going to be Java in the end. And then there's the other side, the other world, where um, as a data scientist, you're more like a science uh, guy or a science person. And you, of course, like Python or R. You like the dynamic uh, nature of the language. And you have a stronger emphasis on uh, cool methods and cool results and not on, on robustness, maybe. And you are happy as long as it runs on your machine. And so there are just two th sides. And of course, there are many ways to resolve this uh, problem. And I'm going to present now several ways how I've seen in projects, how it was done, and, and uh, can discuss this. For instance, one is just to select one to rule them all. So I've uh, once uh, been in a project where it wa uh, was said that in the end, yeah, OK, it's got to be Java in the end. So um, Right, directly start doing everything in, in Java. And I know that uh, I've heard of, I heard that Netflix, for instance, for their recommenders, they do directly everything in, in Java. So this has um, the, the, uh, the, the upside of it is that if you have a single language, of course, it's later going to reduce the complexity of your deployment. I mean, most companies, they know how, what to do with Java. You can package everything into a nice char and, and run it in some application server or so on. And um, the downside, the huge downside of it, of it is, of course, that you're completely abandoning one ecosystem. Um, in case of Java, it would be the, the Python um, ecosystem. So you don't have scikit-learn. You don't have pandas and so on. So you have to re-implement a lot. But it's a, it's a solution that some companies do. Another thing is if you just say, OK, Python is the winner. How um, about putting everything in Python um, in production? This is um, yeah, especially cool if you're then a, a data scientist, because uh, you can still do your favorite programming language. Um, I found from my experiences that it's especially useful for the batch prediction use cases. So in the categorization I've shown before, so if you're doing some kind of predictions um, that you only have to do once a day, um, something like, like we, we did at, at Blue Yonder, that you, you're predicting the demand of the next uh, two weeks or so. If you, have, if, you, if you have 24 hours to do one batch prediction, then that's a perfect use case for, for Python, actually. If you need um, some kind of web service delivery, of course, you have many. Um, Python is a, a general-purpose language. You have many nice libraries like Flask um, to make some small uh, REST service. Uh, when you do Python, you can also always just scale horizontally if uh, someone comes with a, re, uh, with a point that maybe um, Python is not fast enough compared to Java. You can always uh, scale horizontally during prediction. And during training, it's um, what I like the most is to have just a big metal node with many cores, a uh, huge number, uh, a, a huge amount of RAM, where you can then uh, train your model. And um, the good thing with Python is that you are also not only bound um, to the, 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 the Python ecosystem, you can also tap into the Hadoop world, for instance, with using PySpark and PyHive. So their libraries, they, of course, have some limitations compared to the, the Java libraries. 
but uh, you can do, you can um, nowadays with uh, Spark 2.3 um, use uh, a lot of things uh, from, from Python. And if you then later want to um, deploy something, um, it's good to think about isolated containers and maybe use uh, Docker for it, just to have the, all the dependencies and so on in, packaged in one thing, because there exists uh, nothing like a, like a char file, for instance, where you have everything packaged. Another solution to the problem is what I think is the worst case scenario is you let um, a team of uh, data scientists do something in, in, in Python or R, and then some poor person has to rewrite everything in Java. So this is something uh, which once happened to me that I wrote a lot of Python and then uh, we were sitting together um, and making a conversion to Java because it was only allowed to have Java in production. It's really lots of effort, it's slow. If you then later on, we said, it's, um, building a data product is an iterative process, so if you later on decide on new features, then of course uh, you implement them in first in, in Python, then someone um, moves it over to Java, it's, it takes forever, it's uh, causing a lot of bugs. If you see a bug in production, it's always hard to find out, okay, is the bug maybe um, in the Java code? Um, or is this an actual reason in the, in the, was it in the, in the Python code? So is it by design uh, a mistake? So um, the, the upside is that everyone gets what they want, but um, I would never uh, argue in favor of this um, solution to the, to the two language problem. Um, um, so another thing I've never really tried out um, is that you say, okay, let's just use exchangeable formats. I mean, there are many around, like PMML, ONNX, and so on. They work great in theory, but if you try a little bit out with them, so just uh, we, we tested it once, we never put something like this in production, is that they have quite a limited functionality. You have no guarantee that if um, you use Python, you do your model, you save it in some exchangeable format, and then you read it in, in Java, for instance, that um, it really does the same thing. So you have to, imp you have to trust those two implementations and um, yeah, I mean, it's just like even with something like HTML, you never, uh, two websites are never rendered the same way on two different browsers, so why would it be, um, why would it work then for those exchangeable uh, formats? So um, yeah, and another downside they often have, they don't include the pre-processing and feature generation. So this is what I said before when I'm talking about the model, it's not only the machine learning algorithm, it's also all the imputations and all the things you did beforehand. And um, of course those exchangeable formats, they, they need to be able to specify this, otherwise you're um, re-implementing uh, things again. Uh, another solution for the language uh, problem is using frameworks. So uh, we've used TensorFlow for, especially for some recommendation tasks, and it's really nice in the way that you use Python to train your model. You save it in some some binary format, uh, it's some protobuf-based uh, format, and then this this binary blob can be read in by Java and served uh, by Java. And this is a, a really a nice thing. There are other frameworks, of course. H2O is quite common. Um, we've also done something with this. And uh, there we had a little bit of problem that not, it doesn't allow so much pre-processing. So the, you have uh, basic machine le learning algorithms in there, but not all of the pre-processing. And there it's also that you um, use Python to build your model. Then you save everything into a Mojo file, it's called, and later on, Python uh, can run it. If you opt for this solution, which I think can be a valid one, depending on your use case, um, as I said many times, but of course you should always keep in mind that you are paying with flexibility. <coughs> so um, if you decide on a framework, you will only ever be able to do what the, uh, what the framework um, provides, which can be fine, um, but maybe it's a, it's a limitation also. So we've... Um, Basically, we have seen um, different ways, um, different possibilities, different doors, how to, um, how to overcome this uh, two-language problem. There's the re-implementation, 
um, just re-implement everything in Java or use a framework or decide in a single language. So from my experience, definitely um, re-implementation is no option. So don't do this. Um, I've been there. It's, uh, it's not working so good. Um, of course, frameworks um, are a valid solution. If you use TensorFlow or H2O, um, they can really help you get things into production way uh, easier in overcoming the, the two language problem. And if you decide on a single language, okay, I'm a bit biased here, I would uh, definitely choose uh, Python and not let um, data scientists program in, in Java um, because this is really uh, frustrating. Um, or even Scala. So, um, talking about, um, yeah, so we've, we've talked about the, the language problem and now a little bit more about the deployment and some maybe general um, advices and good practices. Um, of course, the deployment, there's no, as I said before, there's no um, one size fits all. Um, it heavily depends on your use case and of the um, use case evalu evaluation that you've done before. Of course, there are um, software engineering principles that you should always use, like, as I said before, continuous integration, continuous delivery. I can't say it often enough, just do it. Um, and also think about um, what part of your machine learning code actually um, how big it is compared to all the other things. So there's a nice paper by Scully, 2015, already a few years old. It's, um, it's saying uh, where the technical debt in machine learning systems actually is. And we see that in the middle, your machine learning code, there's not much technical debt in there, but um, everything around just doesn't get enough focus. And a lot of those uh, boxes are actually related to deployment. So your configuration, your process management, your uh, machine res uh, resource management, your serving infrastructure, your, your monitor especially, those are all things you need to care about and this doesn't get enough attention um, in, in really many projects. So this uh, Scully uh, paper was a kind of survey and uh, it's good to, to keep this in, in, in mind. So general principles again, version your things, package have processes and quality managers, uh, management in place. Um, it also helps to keep the development and production environment as similar as, possi as possible, of course. So like programming your one thing on a Mac and moving everything else then on a, on a Linux system. I mean, already there you can uh, run into problem even if it's, if it's Python. Automate as much as possible. Again, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, this also avoid, avoids human errors. And think about controllable uh, environments like, um, like, for instance, by using Docker or at least having Conda environments or um, other environments uh, that you can pin uh, versions down. Google also thinks a lot about this and they have a, um, also a nice uh, blog post about best practices for machine learning engineering. I'm not going to go through all those um, different uh, rules. Um, basically, many have been already said, design and implement metrics and so on. Most of them are actually, if you want to th bring things in, into production, most of uh, things are actually engineering problems. So this is, it's, in the end, it's not your cool data science model. Um, it's really a lot of engineering problems you have to overcome to bring things uh, into production. Um, just as a, as a practical tip, how easy uh, or practical advice, uh, how easy it is to do continuous uh, integration. Um, um, there, um, it's also a blog post link. You will later see the slides. But if you use Jenkins and uh, let's say DevPI artifact store um, to, uh, to save your, your build packages, it's just like two jobs. You have one Jenkins job that clones the repo, builds the package, pushes it in some uh, unstable index. Then you have another Jenkins job that installs the package, runs the unit tests um, after having cloned um, the, the, the repository again. And then depending on the results of the unit test, pushes it back into some um, some testing or some stable index, and then other people can use um, the new version. And 
Speaking about packaging, so um, a really cool tool for doing this, and it's really easy to use. It's like a five seconds thing. It's PyScaffold. It provides you easy, insane Python packages. It's just giving you a kind of template uh, tool for this, a template a scaffold for a typical Python project. It provides you with versioning for every commit. So you basically just do um, git tags and so on for the version, and then it uh, enumerates the commit. So you have unique versions out of the box. It integrates really well with, uh, with uh, Git, uh, has pre-commit. You have a declarative way of defining all the, the configuration for your, for your package with the help of setup uh, config. It follows community standards and you can even um, extend it uh, with your extension. So as the last slide, a uh, short recap what we learned. Um, so the, the, the key learnings um, really are for data science to production that um, there's no one size fits all solution. Evaluate your use case and then think about how you can uh, bring things into uh, production early on. Um, think about quality. Quality assurance is really important. Try to establish a DevOps culture and a team responsibility for the whole data product and not just for some fancy data science model. Then uh, think about how you overcome the, the two language problem that you might have as a Python developer. Embrace processes and automate, uh, automate as much as possible and the key thing really is production is not an afterthought. So think early on about how you can later uh, move things uh, into production. With this, I want to close my talk. Thank you for your patience and your attention. Thank you very much, Florian. Very interesting talk and many interesting and, and important things. You have to do when we develop software. Any questions? Yes. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, it's really great uh, to see someone putting effort and sharing those insights. Uh, I've got a question on the uh, monitoring part of, of your talk. Um, how would you put a process in place to monitor the performance of uh, the model, whether it's making suitable recommendations or uh, predictions? Um, after, right? Because I think you mentioned a technique whereby you can visually see if the model is confused, but what about when we don't really know what sort of input the model is going gonna, is gonna to get? How can we later on see if we can improve the model based on the errors I might have done and put a process around that? Yeah, so um, I would divide the monitoring in, in several parts. Of course, you need to have some um, monitoring for the incoming data. This is really important because then you can easily see all the errors which are just due to the fact that you got new outliers or maybe just uh, not available values somewhere. So you should have monitoring in place. This is the incoming data. Does it still look like last week? You can define alarms on this and uh, like, okay, suddenly we have uh, not seven categories in this feature, but 10 or why are the number of not available values went up from 10% to, to 50% and so on. So this is like the early alarming, what goes into your model. And then you have the monitoring some, some uh, after um, your model, so the results of your model. There you can check simple things like how many predictions did I make? Is the number of predictions still uh, as high as maybe last week if you're yeah, I don't know, depending on your use case, what you are uh, predicting, then what I showed before this one slide about um, that you really check each result and do this uh, histogram, this response analysis of your model, this uh, can really help. Um, and uh, of course, also those, um, when you iterate and make a new model, you will have some offline metrics that you also save those um, and put um, the version number uh, next to it that you can see maybe, I mean, it looked good offline, but then the uh, online KPI metrics went down. So this is again like offline, uh, the offline metrics there you can automize a lot and check for accuracy or a recall or whatever you wanna check. 
and um, at the same time, you have to look um, at the yeah at the at the KPIs, which might might be then the the, the the click through rate. So there are many. It really depends on the use case, but there are many aspects. So I would say input, output, then the model quality, uh, technical things like also is there maybe maybe your model is uh, getting slower and you running into a lot of timeouts and um, all those uh, things. Hey, so I wanted to ask you about the DevOps culture. Uh, about if you what? have DevOps culture. Ah, DevOps culture, okay. Uh, if you have experienced that before, and what problems did you find integrated the whole different thing skills to, to work as a system thinking? So, I've, in, in one project it was before that, that we were like only data scientists and then we had all those problems. And then um, there was a decision made that we have heterogeneous teams and then we were um, yeah, doing more uh, DevOps culture. I mean, of course, first of all, it's a little bit, okay, why do we now work together and people react differently on this? And then there's also this like struggle sometimes if um, let's say there comes a software engineer and asks you about your model and then may, some people get critical and like, so hey, I'm the data scientist, what are you asking me? Uh, why I'm, am I doing this in my model? I'm the expert. And the, for some people this can be quite hard at first, but um, yeah, you have to overcome this. You, you, you need to communicate and you need to think, okay, this person has another background, but um, it has all, uh, the, the person has all the rights to know what is going on in the model. So there's at there, it starts with a little struggle, I would say, but then it calms down and it's definitely better in the end than it was before, from my experience. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it also depends on what kind of people are uh, in, in, in your team, if you have maybe some completely introverted uh, data scientists, then it could be hard for them maybe. So, um, yeah. Okay, last question. Hi, uh, so I think the, the choice of the uh, language is definitely a big issue uh, in my company. So basically we have a, a very heavy uh, Java legacy process. It serves two things. One thing is build like a pipeline, like you need one do thing, one thing, and then feed the data to unit two that all in Java. But now we want to plug in uh, Python computations. So the way we are trying it is from individual. We still keep the backbone as Java, and then the individual node, we try to wrap around the Python script, basically Java wrap around the Python and then fire up the Python process. Okay. You know, the data and the caching certainly is a problem, so we would like to, you know, explore like uh, Apache Arrow uh, in the near future. So do you have any, you know, experience of, you know, Java, fire up, fire Python process, share the cache sort of experience? Does it work so, well? So I've, I've actually Something. also tried to, uh, I once had the idea, yeah, well, I just do some char where I put in all my Python code and then run it, and I had extreme problem getting this to run with any kind of library like, like NumPy and so on. There is this pi for j You can do things like this, and for simple, um, for really simple uh, Python application it works, but really simple, but I would not, it's a really, it's a hack. And if you then have any NumPy, which is C, also wrapped in this and you have those conversion costs but then again I'm not um, I'm no expert in in those Java to uh, Python thing like on a on a really software uh, level I know uh, I know arrow and um, it's in spark 2.3 and things get a lot faster uh, but I've never programmed with arrow directly because uh, but I would actually I would be careful with doing things like this, uh, wrapping uh, your Python things in, 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 in Java sounds like a huge hack to me. I would rather go for establishing uh, interfaces. I mean, if you have a pipeline, and I mean, depending on your, your runtime requirements, if you can say you use a database as an interface kind of thing that it's safe there and you grab it from Python, you do your calculation, you save it there, then it, it could work depending how fast it needs to be in the end. But I would rather define some clear 
interfaces and not do any kind of black magic with uh, Python inside uh, Java. Thanks a lot. Yeah.